Okay, we're recording. Let's do it. Um, so first off, I want to thank all of our panelists and everyone watching tonight for taking time out of your day to join us for a conversation on something that is personally really, really meaningful and exciting for me. Um, I'm grateful every day for the opportunity to do good work with WEVA and moving into transformative justice um, is just such a heartfelt new direction for us. Um, before we go any further, I want to stop for a moment and acknowledge and offer gratitude to the people whose territories we're on. Um, WEVA is on the unceded and ancestral homelands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, and for myself, I'm personally here on the territory of the Lekwungen people tonight. Um, so I'm assuming that folks are joining us in from kind of everywhere. So I just wanted to offer a moment for everybody to just take a breath and maybe um, acknowledge and offer some gratitude to the folks whose land you're on right now. So 2020 has taught us a lot of really hard lessons. Um, and one of them for me is the urgent need to acknowledge and restore Indigenous sovereignty um, from the invasion of Wet'suwet'en earlier this year to the impacts of colonization on the climate and the resulting wildfires um, to the calls to end the racist institution of policing on these lands. These things are not separate from our conversation today about queer visions for healing justice and I hope that we get the chance to attend to all those intersections today. Um, so I'm your host, Felix, and I'm grateful to work at WEVA. Uh, WEVA is a feminist, anti-oppressive, decolonizing rape crisis center operating on unceded Coast Salish territories. We provide support services to survivors of, sexual, or of sexualized violence who have shared experiences of gender marginalization uh, that cis and trans women, two-spirit, trans, and non-binary people. We advocate for social and systemic change through education, outreach, and activism. Um, we're also excited to announce our upcoming transformative justice project for survivors of sexualized violence. And we're offering this panel today as an introduction to the intersections of sexual violence, queerness, and resisting carceral feminism. Um, I've also just been asked to plug that if folks are watching this and really interested in doing transformative justice with sexual violence, that uh, keep an eye on our social media because we're going to be hiring into some really exciting um, positions having to do with transformative justice and sexual violence going forward. Um, so just a little housekeeping note for tonight. We have our chat bar turned off, but our office manager, Michaela, is standing by if you need anything. Um, so just feel free to use that Q&A function to get a hold of Michaela. Um, we are hoping to have time for a bit of Q&A at the end. So if you want to just pass your cues along to Michaela and then she can pass them on to me. Okay. So I'm going to take a moment just to introduce our panelists. And then after that, that will be enough of me talking and we can turn it over to these three brilliant minds. So first off, we have Kristen Lee. Kristen, do you want to give a little wave? That's Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen has been a collective member of the Prisoner Correspondence Project since 2009. Founded in 2007, PCP is a pen pal program in Jotjage or Montreal that connects LGBTQ prisoners across Canada and the United States with similarly identified people on the outside. The project also publishes a biannual newsletter with submissions from inside membership and organizes a library with over 200 resources available to prisoners at no cost. Entirely run by volunteers, the collective is composed of five to 10 outside members who answer letters, send resources, match up pen pals, and compile the newsletter. An inside collective of around 30 people chooses newsletter themes, reviews news resources, and offers feedback to monthly collective meeting minutes. The project currently has over 4,000 members in around 400 prisons. So thanks, Kristen. Really excited to have you tonight. Next up, we have Amber. Do you want to give a little wave to Amber? Cool. Amber Goulet is a queer, uh, sorry, that's a tongue twister, a queer Cree woman <laughs> from Amisco Siwaskaigan, um, Edmonton, in Treaty 6 territory, and currently a fourth year UBC undergraduate completing her Bachelor of Arts, double majoring in First Nations and Indigenous Studies and Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. As part of the First Nations and Indigenous program in 2019-2020, Amber partnered with us at WEVA to engage and design a community research project examining the strengths and weaknesses of moving beyond state approaches to sexualized violence within Indigenous communities. 
Her interests include conversations about decolonizing feminism, gender, sexuality, violence, and curating alternative ways of unpacking intergenerational trauma. After Amber completes her degree at UBC, she hopes to move on to a master's degree program with a focus in art and community engagement. And last but not least, we have Minakshi. Uh, Minakshi Manoa is a settler living on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people since 2006. In her role at P uh, Pivot Legal Society, she works alongside interdisciplinary colleagues to envision intersectional approaches to policing and criminalization. She values Pivot's uncompromising commitment to the expertise and vision of people with lived and living experience. Her work emphasizes the impact of policing across campaign areas. Prior to joining Pivot, she held a variety of frontline and administrative positions at legal and social service agencies in Vancouver. Minakshi is a graduate of the UBC School of Social Work and registered social worker. She is currently a board member for the Community Radio Education Society, a programmer at Vancouver Co-op Radio, Stark Raven, and a member of the Vancouver Prison Justice Day Committee. So that's our panelists tonight. I'm so excited to have three people here with such interesting and really brilliant um, experience and thoughts to share with us. So my very first question is to Amber, and I think it might be <laughs> one of the hardest questions of the night. Um, so the, Amber, the, the, the concept of transformative justice is being talked about more and more um, in response to harm these days. So I have a deceptively simple question for you, which is, uh, can you tell us what, what is transformative justice? Okay. So transformative justice is essentially a strategy that's based on identifying the root cause of a problem, either for conflict or for violence, and its whole outlook is to create a transformal and regional sort of relational educational opportunity for survivors, for those who cause harm and their communities. So it's, it's moving beyond a state criminal justice system, this alternative strategy works to build capacity within a community to address accountability and response and to end um, response to and to also create prevention of violence and conflict. Um, and it's still somewhat of a contentious issue um, within within lots of different communities, just as the reason being is that the carceral justice state system is clearly not working. It's not um, addressing a lot of the issues that are happening within communities. Um, and transformative justice kind of comes out of a transformation um, and growth from different alternative ways of looking at justice. So it, it differs from restorative justice. Restorative justice is definitely a step to towards something new and something better, but Restorative justice systems generally still work along the carceral state system. And so the carceral state system is very based on the crown versus the person who committed harm. And it ignores the survivor and it, it ignores the systemic issues that are happening that are causing the harm in communities. So it takes a different step a bit further and it just builds on creating um, alternative ways of dealing with harm within the community by community. And so in that sense, it's very, um, it's not a one box fits all. It, it can be very transform transformative for each community. And so that community can say, this works, this works, this works, and then this doesn't work for us. And so it really creates a community accountability praxis and um, so it's just a step in the right direction. It, it, it doesn't rely on the system that fails survivors all the time. It actually empowers and engages the community in much different ways. Um, yeah, so I think that's a general sort of overview mm -hmm. of this, of this uh, conversation. But I think the more we talk about it tonight, the more we'll kind of understand it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how you say that. that um you know, we, we don't have, like, the reason that I say that that's such a hard question right now is because I, I feel like none of us have a canned answer for what is TJ. Um, we talk a lot about what it's not. Um, and that also feels important to me because, you know, coming from a feminist rape crisis center, we've seen for 
38 years now how criminal justice is not working for survivors. The vast majority of folks are not satisfied with their experiences and in fact feel almost like um, an accessory or a witness to the experience um, versus an active participant. So one thing that really stands out to me from your definition, Amber, is this piece about um, participation from the folks, uh, from survivors in um, developing an analysis of what justice really means. Yeah, and I think that's the major difference from a carceral state point of view is that we're centering survivors and not centering essentially the crown who is also causing harm. Mm -hmm. Great. Kristen, I see you nodding a lot. I, I feel like you have thoughts to add to that. Um, yeah, so I mean, so we had the questions kind of shared in advance. So maybe I could, this kind of touches on something I want to speak to in one of the questions that came up, which is kind of like, um, one of the criticisms of, you know, defunding the police and abolishing prisons is just like, always like, what are we going to do with the rapists? And what would happen to the rapists without police? And I think that what you're saying, Amber, really like kind of leads us into that. And um, so the way I was thinking about that question was really, you know, for that question to make sense, we need to assume that prisons and the police are in fact effective tools against rape, which as we've just been speaking about, and I'm sure like lots of people at WEVA have experiences with, that is not the case. And so I kind of want to just like maybe lead us into that conversation a little bit. Um, and so I think, you know, on a practical level, and Felix, you alluded to this, you know, the police is not an effective answer to sexual assault because we know that most cases of sexual violence occurs between people who know each other and often fairly intimately. So like people who are inside the same family, for example. And in these contexts, you know, sexual violence often doesn't get reported to the police because the lives of the perpetrator and the survivor are often very intimately intertwined. So calling the police and then sending the perpetrator to prison then can mean like losing access to one's livelihood, for example. And like Felix was saying, you know, we know that reporting sexual assault to the police and going through the testimonial court system can be a very harrowing process. So then that ends up dissuading people from reporting sexual assault as well. So, I mean, one of the um, arguments in favor of transformative justice is actually that having a more open and more relational and more flexible and more participatory approach actually encourages more survivors to come forward um, and share their experiences. Um, and then I've also been thinking a lot about how, you know, there's like, oftentimes there's kind of like, a scapegoat to like an older form of feminism that's kind of like carceral feminism. And I've been thinking about how, you know, like actually prisons and police to some, like actually really directly contradict, I think the original mission that led to the founding of organizations like WEVA. So like in the seventies and eighties, the feminist movement, you know, fought to bring sexual violence and domestic violence from the private realm into the public sphere and feminists reframed gender violence not as a domestic issue that's dealt with interpersonally inside the home but rather as a political issue stemming from a patriarchal society and something that we need to address collectively and using prisons and the police and the carceral state to address sexual violence actually reverses the issue into a private one again mm -hmm. as a problem of individual pathology. So then it becomes a question of, you know, a few bad people who are responsible for all harm in society and what we need to do is just remove them and lock them up. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, this essentially just lets the broader patriarchal structure off the hook and I think transformative justice is kind of like a return to an earlier feminist analysis that recognizes sexual violence as a systemic problem, which could only be addressed by broadening the scope of responsibility to all of us. So I think that adds, that is totally in line with Amber's definition. Yeah, thank you. I really like um, that framing that you offered of it, this idea of um, criminal justice or of carceral feminists as being an individual solution to a problem that we know is systemic. Um, 
and Amber, your definition of transformative justice offers us like a way to think of a response to harm that is existing on a community or on a systemic level, um, similar to the way that harm was caused. And I think it's important to also include not just the survivor, the broader community, but also the people who cause harm in that community. Mm. Um, I agree with you, Kristen. I don't think locking a, a group of people up and throwing away the keys, it's not solving any problems. So that's another, another facet of transformative justice that I really think is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me like open this question up um, even broader and just ask all of you folks, like we know that one, um, as you spoke to Kristen, one really common criticism of defunding the police or moving to an alternative um, way of thinking about justice is that uh, rapists won't be held accountable. And Kristen, I really love how you speak to the fact that, you know, under our current system, it's pretty clear to see that rapists aren't being held accountable under criminal justice. Um, so just to ask even more broadly, I'm wondering what all three of you think, um, what would happen to rapists if we didn't have police? I guess some of them would lose their jobs <laughs> if we funded the police. Um, uh, not to put too fine of a point on it, um, but I mean, of course, like I coming from like Vancouver, I can't help but think about um, officers like Jim Fisher, um, the culture of covering up corruption and exploitation within the VPD. Um, but I, I think um, is yeah, I can talk about like defunding, but I, I wanted to just kind of like situate myself in relation to this conversation, if that's okay with folks. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, so, and like a lot of this is reiterating, reiterating what Amber and Kristen have already shared, but I think about like, um, like what brings us each to a panel about transformative justice honestly feels a little bit silly because I feel like Angela Davis is doing panels every week and I don't have much to add. Um, but I'll try and like localize some of my own thoughts. Um, and as someone who's like living on these sovereign unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil I think that, um, yeah, that's like the, the first and foremost transformation that we need to do. And as Amber said, you know, the current criminal justice situation situates harm in relation to the, the crown and the crown is doing harm and perpetuating harm. Um, so I think that we, and here I'm talking to non-Indigenous and non-Black folks, um, including racialized settlers like myself, we have to make a complete shift in our relationship to these territories. Um, into the sovereign nations that have been in relationship with the territory, um, wherever we happen to be in so-called Canada. Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking about transformative justice and policing, like of course in my day-to-day -day work at Pivot, I'm thinking about, yeah, police accountability, um, the role that the police have come to occupy in relation to the state known as Canada. Um, and Pivot's work has emphasized, you know, the experiences of people at the margins. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit critical of mainstream feminism, including like feminist anti-violence organizations, because I, I do think that um, that has not been fully centered in the dominant approach to anti-violence work in Canada. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of how we've even had to like see in recent years, in the past 10 years, um, transform, or sorry, um, transition houses needed to create policies around substance use and mental health issues. Um, that's absolutely ludicrous, right? That there are homes that don't want to accept survivors who may be using substances or may have mental health issues, even though clearly those are very understandable responses to the experiences of harm. So I'm not interested in letting feminism off the hook mm -hmm. because I've, I've seen the violence that it does and how it has in its institutional form become complicit with the state, um, often seduced by the idea of being at the table, of making change from the inside, um, of representational politics. And I just have to ask, whose representation 
who's insides and why. Um, so when we're talking about transformative justice, I also think we have to recognize the critical interventions that black feminists made into the dominant feminist narrative. I'm thinking of folks like Boundaries of Critical Resistance, of Survived and Punished, Beth Ritchie, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Angela Davis, um, Marsha P. Johnson, like folks who were looking at this movement and they were like, yes, let's take violence out of the realm of the domestic, but not, not at the expense of incarcerating black and brown men in our communities. Um, which is what happened, right? And Beth Ritchie talks about this. We won the war. We won the battle around domestic violence, but we lost the war around gender violence because in recognizing it as a violent act in creating laws that legislated punishment, we saw the expansion of mass incarceration. And I think similarly in Canada, we've seen that. Um, so yeah, I just want to credit all the feminists and organizers who question the need for state-centric justice in response to intimate partner violence and sexualized violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Manakshi. I, I really love how you um, draw parallels between the way that I think um, a feminist movement became a feminist sector of nonprofits. And of course, as nonprofits, like we're beholden to structures um, that have not traditionally worked for the people that we're supposed to serve. So when we're talking about um, things like resisting carceral feminism or resisting carceral justice, we have to be locating that within um, systems that encourage us to keep relying on the state in that way. Um, and as you like really brilliantly point out, and actually like that, is directly opposed a lot of the time to what we're trying to do, especially if we're trying to get out of this, like these grips of white feminism that keep, I think, our scope really narrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, working towards a greater understanding and a, um, there is a need for communities to take back control. And I think that the way that we can start doing that is creating, um, a better and broader understanding of what prevention looks like within a community, how that operates. And that takes all the community members. It doesn't, um, you can't really count yourself out if you're going to be a part of a community. I think that that's the work that you need to put into it. Um, and that involving the community not only centers the survivor, it also centers the idea that we need to humanize people. I think that there is a, a very quick knee-jerk response to dehumanize those who cause harm. And I think that by doing so, it cuts ourselves short on understanding why these systemic issues are occurring in the first place. I think that if we spend more time and energy to put into a prevention-based framework within the community, however that looks for that community specifically, that's the beauty of transformative justice is that you can make it fit to whatever you need it to be. Mm -hmm. But it does take the whole community to do that. And I think that's a first step that we can do if we were to think of a world without police and sexualized violence is really look at preventative measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like what you have to say about um, humanizing people who have caused harm. Um, so I realized I didn't really introduce this at the beginning, but I work at WEVA as our uh, trans inclusion coordinator. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to queer and trans people in my community about what sexual violence looks like for us. Um, and one of the first and I think most pervasive things that's come up over and over again is that folks who are causing harm are also people who have experienced harm. Um, this idea of separating these people into two really narrow categories, like offering a queer analysis um, like completely blows it up. Like we can't be holding these two really distinct um, categories of like people who are harmed and people who cause harm. Um, Krista, I'm, I'm wondering, I feel like that is getting into a lot of the work that uh, Prisoner Correspondence Project does. So I'm wondering if you would like to speak to of this, this piece around um, dehumanizing people who have caused harm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so we at the project, we work with you know, like some of our members 
are people who have committed sexual violence and some have experienced sexual violence and a lot of people have experienced both you know as perpetrator and victim um and something that this is something that comes up for us a lot because we'll have people who have a critical analysis of prisons and write to us and want to get involved and become pen pals and then um well give them like the list of people and they choose someone and then sometimes people will look up the pen pal that they chose and see what they're convicted of and come back and like get really upset and decide that they don't want to write to them anymore or even like get upset with us that we're expend extending our project to include people who are con convicted of sex crimes so this is something that happens i think there's something that's like a very deep punitive ex feeling towards people sex offenders that extends even to um people who are like a, have a critical analysis of prisons and police and that's something we talk about a lot at the project of like how do we engage with this while also being recognizing the harm and the pain and the ongoing trauma that sexual violence you know um causes in people who experience it and not like making light of the effects of sexual violence um but um i do want to speak a little bit about this um, binary, you know, between uh, perpetrator and victim, which is kind of what this justice system is built on, this idea of, you know, protecting the good people by locking away the bad people and punishing the bad people. And we found, of course, that like this just doesn't hold not only in a queer context, but just like across the board. So, I mean, first of all, like people who are considered perpetrators are often themselves, you know, victims of sexual assault in their past and often like from childhood onward. And um, so one of our collective members has like relayed a story that has really left an impression on me where he um, had a meeting with a defense lawyer who specifically works with adult sex offenders and she is friends with lots of people who are social workers supporting children who um, are living through situations of like sexual abuse and you know her friends would ask her how can you possibly defend these people who commit these kinds of crimes and her answer was you know like we are working with the exact same people just at different stages of their lives and that's something that we found that's been very reflective of our experience of the project and like people will write to us and kind of like often we get letters just like people telling us their life stories even while just requesting like a simple um resource or something just because people often don't have a lot of people to speak to when they're in, in prison and you know they tell us about the abuse that they experience and then we'll look up their address and their like profile to verify their address and see that they've been convicted of the crime a crime that's similar to what they've described to us so oftentimes the people who have committed these harms have themselves experienced it and i think another way that um this binary breaks down is that you know for people who have experienced sexual violence when they don't fit into the ideal of like a perfectly innocent victim those people are also themselves criminalized so you know like a lot of women are in prison for defending themselves against abusers, but this also happens in cases where, you know, the police would be called during um, an assault and discover that both parties are actually involved in other illegal activities and arrest the both of them. So this is also where like the line gets really murky and the criminal justice system, even though it relies on this rhetoric, doesn't itself actually uphold that division in practice. And um, I mean, also like prisons themselves are just sites of sexual violence. So the people who end up incarcerated face a very high risk of experiencing rape. And, you know, this comes from prisons being very stressful environments. They're often overcrowded and people are living in varying states of deprivation. And this ends up fostering a high rate of all kinds of violence, including sexual violence from both other prisoners and guards and um in prison like in real life these um rapes are often 
unreported. And when they do get reported, like the way that prisons deal with it is just by placing people in what's called um, protective custody or administrative cust um, segregation, which is just like placing people in solitary confinement and then letting the situation kind of run its course. And when that happens, prisoners lose access to their mail, they lose access to yard time and, you know, often a lot of their belongings. So there's people, very often people just don't report um, their uh, experiences and there's very little counseling inside for people who have experienced sexual assault. And that's also an experience we've had, like we've, um, we had an inside collective member who um, wrote to us about like trying to get great better access to counseling in prison for survivors of sexual assault. And when that came out, she was placed in solitary confinement for a few days and like eventually was given five minutes, like a month to talk to a counselor who was basically like, well, rape happens in prison. Mm -hmm. It is what it is, you know? And we actually found out that in August that she had died in prison, but there's like not really any information about what happened. So this happens a lot. And um, so when I hear about, you know, like when the Harvey Weinstein case was happening, we had a lot of people on the left and feminists kind of celebrating his incarceration. Some even like being, some people even gloating that he's gonna get a taste of his own medicine in prison. I feel like this, it's like a very problematic approach. And um, it makes me think about like one of our collective members saying, you know, like, when people do this, they're basically saying that rape is not bad, it's just happening to the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of these um, experiences we've had kind of um, undo the binary between per perpetrator and victim, and I think just show that we need to move away from a system that relies on it and propagates that rhetoric. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. I love... Um... Yeah, you know, I, I was, as you were speaking, I was reflecting on um, the the years I spent um, working in frontline social services roles and with similar feelings that, you know, where the rubber hits the road um, with people who are experiencing just immense amount of systemic oppressions in their life, these binaries break down um, almost immediately. It really resonated for me when you were talking about um, meeting people at just different points along their journey. Um, I know I was a youth worker in Vancouver for quite a long time um, and seeing the same youth sort of move through the system um, and make this transition from a youth that we're all sort of looking out for and protecting and then coming out the other side as like a youth that now we're protecting the other youth from. Um, and that transition happens um, over not a huge amount of time and we're talking about the same people. And so I think that there's really parallels there to draw towards transformative justice and as you were saying, Amber, like this idea of, of breaking cycles. Mm -hmm. um, Manakshi, you brought up something earlier that I, I wanted to sort of circle back to you um, when you were talking about how TJ was really created by and for uh, cutie BIPOC communities and that we need to be um, slowing down and really paying attention to the, the work that's already gone into this and really um, giving credit where credit is due for this. Um, so I'm wondering a couple of things, like first, if you can speak to that history a bit. And my, my question is, how do we go about doing TJ in a way that continues to be led by cutie BIPOC communities? Yes, and um, guessing Amber will be back in a sec. I know her internet was a bit sketchy. I think she'll be back. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I want to acknowledge like the radical work of queers and particularly leadership of trans women who I think, um, as we've named a number of times, were never contemplated in second wave feminism, certainly, um, or the corollary, the corollary um, approaches to justice that that's informed. So, you know, I'm thinking of here, like trans led organizations like the Coalition Against Trans Antagonism, um, more broadly, or like in the States, Marsha P. Johnson Institute, like these organizations that have dedicated their work to dismantling violent colonial institutions that claim to offer roots to justice. So 
I also wanted to like think about how you know conversations around defunding and even a little little shading of abolition have kind of gone mainstream since June, um, which is phenomenal. And we're witnessing these conversations. Um, we're maybe inviting newcomers into these conversations, and that's like super exciting, right? Um, like we're also meeting new comrades. We're organizing alongside folks who have creative new ideas. Um, we're learning new skills. But I think in these openings, and you know what happens as something becomes a bit more mainstream or absorbed into a dominant narrative is. Um, a reminder that we have to remember the accountabilities that we hold to folks in the margins. Um, so recognizing QT BIPOC leadership, recognizing the vital interventions that like Indigenous and Black feminists made into these broader conversations around justice. Um, I think we see also real potential for co-optation. Mm -hmm. And again, feminist institutions looking at you and myself. Um, so particularly thinking about how government, lawmakers, nonprofits, and all these other frustrating institutions love to use promises to produce conformity and respectability in our work, right? We've all kind of seen how we'll be strung along like, well, I think if we frame it as defunding and not abolition, we're gonna get more doors opened. Um, if we frame it around justice rather than abolition, we're going to see more doors open. Um, and like, I get it. We all have to be strategic in the places where we operate. Um, but I think it's just a real reminder that um, folks like Sylvia Riviera, Marsha P. Johnson, like respectability wasn't even on the menu. Um, and I think in their strident approach, they knew that like that wasn't actually the answer. Um, so look to abolitionist QT BIPOC folks who've led this work and be reminded through their experiences, their writing, their analysis, their speeches, right? We're all on the internet. We can access these pieces of information. We can remind ourselves that respectability is not the same as justice, that representation at the table is not the same as justice, and it cannot ever substitute for it. Um, I think as we are shifting these perspectives, we also have to remind ourselves of how accountability is going to go from the margin to center, right? Building on this idea that bell hooks first came up with. Um, we need to question our institutions. And of course, for me, it's police, but also nonprofit leadership, as we've mentioned, academia and government. Like, each of these institutions has experienced co-optation by capitalism, by white supremacy, settler colonialism, anti-black racism, and carceral feminism, right? Um, and here again, I'm not speaking in like lofty generalizations. In Vancouver, we have a law school with a dean who defends a notorious anti-trans, anti-sex worker outlet. Um, we have a police board that has representation from the anti-violence sector. Um, we have women in power who refuse to acknowledge the ongoing invasions of sovereign indigenous territory and the construction of man camps in those territories. So we need to be able to hold ourselves and our peers accountable rather than be seduced by piecemeal reforms, including representational politics. Um, I want to share a quote from Beth Ritchie, who's been a really important thinker for me. Um, she is the author of Arrested Justice, which is Black Women, Violence in America's Prison Nation, really one of the foremost thinkers around mass incarceration from a feminist perspective. So she says, we are learning collectively that the way out is not to simply keep pushing back against each of those policies, strategies, and movement organizations that have disappointed us but rather to adopt a feminist political strategy that embraces the possibility of prison abolition. Mm -hmm. This is where we could bring together attention to state violence as an essential aspect of ending violence against women of color and non-gender conforming communities. All people would be safer. This means investing in a new kind of community, especially within communities of color, where those who are most disadvantaged 
are in leadership of sustained base building activities for justice. So again, going from margin to build accountability. Great. Thank you. That was, that was an amazing answer to that question. Um, I, I'm, I, one thing you were saying stood out to me, and I'm, I feel like it might be useful to tease this apart a little bit. You mentioned the difference between um, defunding and abolition. I'm wondering if you can just expand on that a little bit. So when I think about defunding, I think that there are, there are actually municipalities in BC even that have defunded the police. But what it's meant is increased budgets for private security. So mm -hmm. to me, defunding absolutely needs to be paired with like an abolitionist division. It can't be thought of as the end goal. Mm -hmm. It's one tool in an array of strategies that hopefully bring us closer to TJ. Um, we can look at like multi-million billion dollar policing and prison budgets and absolutely we need to make cuts to those rapid drastic <laughs> cuts um but we also need to build and like ferment the conditions so that people aren't being recriminalized upon release so you know defunding the police building up budgets for social health peer-led services um and to me, like there's a difference around defunding with an abolitionist mandate versus defunding with an austerity lens. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like that's a risk, right? Does that kind of lay it out? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I was just, um, I think that that's a bit of a nuance, but it feels important that we be talking about those differences. Um, and just to build off of something else you said, and actually I, I have a question kind of for all three of you, which is, um, you know, we tend to think about we talk about sexual violence or violence generally, we, we tend to think about it in interpersonal um, terms. So harm that might happen just between two people. And again, like I think we're talking about that, that idea of privatizing um, harm. So I'm, I'm wondering from all of you, what does following QD BIPOC leadership teach us about institutional violence? Was that too hard? <laughs> I was thinking about um, what we were talking about earlier as far as um, this, this feminist idea of understanding harm as being systemic um, versus something that might just happen in between two people. And I, one lesson that I know I've really taken from QD BIPOC organizers is that you know, to be looking at a harm in such a narrow lens as just happening between two people ignores the way that carceral system um, really replicates harm and, and entrenches it within communities. Yeah, okay. Well, Amber, I would, um, I would love to switch over and talk a little bit about the amazing research paper that you wrote for WAVA last year. I read it and I loved it. Um, so generally my question for you is, um, what did you find in that research about um, traditional responses to sexual violence? Um, and what are perceptions of maybe TJ or RJ within Indigenous communities? Yeah, I mean, I found what was really helpful was to go back and look for um, sort of the, the timeline of growth of our changing of thought about sexualized violence and, and justice as a whole. And um, it was interesting to kind of go back and, and look through um, this, this idea that was changing that we weren't centering survivors of sexualized violence. We were, mm -hmm. we were centering um, those who cause harm. And that was certainly not a way that communities looked at conflict and violence prior to contact. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, a very firm understanding of, of what the community stood for and everyone had roles within that community and that how that's how communities operated was that everyone had a role to do for the community and so <clears throat> i find that the research really points to the fact that indigenous communities specifically um, have very much of a need and 
are, are wanting an, an alternative way at looking at how to deal with harm in their communities, but they don't necessarily know how to do that because a lot of these sort of new ways of looking are very um, restrictive. They can be very um, biased in their thinking. They don't necessarily look at the systemic issues that Indigenous communities have experienced over the, uh, like the colonial violence that has occurred within communities committed by the state. And so a lot of those things come into play when you think about how Indigenous communities address harm and the the multiple um, layers that come come in addition to all of those things. And so there is very much a need to want to do more. And I think that um, there was a huge boom in transformation in the 90s and then in the, in the millennia. And I think that there's more um, more of a push to drive a more a community accountability structure. Um, so that means that, you know, we're exposing the root of the issue and we're working as a community to address our own complicity in those mm -hmm. issues. And I think that's, that's, that's the hard part that a lot of communities have issue with is the complicity in, in, in all these different ways that harm affects a community. Because it, it does ripple down to all different areas of, of the community. And, um, and so when you look at a colonial system that has a historical practice of devaluizing indigenous ways of knowing and being and handling these things, uh, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's, it's stunted the ways of thinking that we have to only do a certain follow certain protocols or certain ways of dealing with these, with, these, um, with these issues of harm. And I think that we need to go back and to reverse that devaluing of how we, how we look at, at the world. And I think that that's the hard part. Um, and I, and I, there's no real answer for it because every community has to look at it themselves. But I think that, that that's the, the big thing that I found was that there is a push to want to change. There is a push because it, it's not working the way it currently is sitting. Um, and that we need to acknowledge our complicity as a community that we are viewing harm in our communities and we are all pl at play at that. And so I think that's the hard part is turning inward and looking at ourselves as either survivors of harm of committers of harm or just looking the other way. Mm -hmm. So I think that that uh, one of the things that came out of the research was not necessarily answers on how to how to address these really, really big issues. But I think that looking at a guiding principle of believing survivors, that's huge. I think that um, relations between everybody in a community can be really complex. I mean, we, we joke within community that, you know, you always have to double check to see if you're related to someone before you even go on a date. <laughs> so we have to, we have to address our relations with each other. We have to create safe spaces for, for survivors and also their, their families of survivors. We have to build on their circle. We have to surround those survivors of, of, of harm. And we also have to be really willing to be flexible because every situation is going to be very different. It's, we don't, it's not possible just to follow procedure, step by step by step, check off boxes. It doesn't work like that. We also need to respect our indigenous self-determination. That's also key. And then also pushing through the limitations that are set by the carceral state. I think that there are ways that we can deal with harm that we don't need to include the carceral state. We don't need to include the justice state at all. But I think that that includes dreaming big. I think that you have to look beyond state approaches as the end all do all. And, you know, and I think that one of the things that was really helpful throughout the whole research project was to know that there are different ways that we can do it. And I think that it's just rewiring our brains to think that there are different ways of, of dealing with, with conflict and violence in community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, 
Um, I, have, I have so many thoughts about all the amazing things you just said. Um, one thing that I really love about what transformative justice offers, and you kind of mentioned it, is, is a, a means for us all to examine our own complicity in systems. Um, I was chatting with a, a good friend of mine the other day about this and talking about how, you know, coming from um, even queer community in a city like Vancouver, I have borne witness to a lot of harm that's happened within community um, and a lot of erasure of harm that's happened. Um, because of course we're talking about a pathologized community, you know, we have this real fear of airing our dirty laundry. And so sexual violence in queer communities feels like a dirty secret. Um, and for myself, you know, I've sat very uncomfortably with the ways that I've seen that happen. Um, I haven't always said something. I haven't always attended to harm that's right in front of me because of all these fears of like, what's going to happen if I'm um, airing the dirty laundry of my community. And so transformative justice is so beautiful because not only does it offer a way for us to meaningfully attend to harm that's happened, it, I, one of my hopes is that it gives me a path um, to restoring, you know, the harm that I did by staying complicit in those things. Um, one more thing that I would like to add is that I think the word community also gets thrown around a lot mm -hmm. as a sort of umbrella term, but what I mean about community is whoever your community is around you, whether that's you're living as an urban indigenous person like myself, whether you're living on reserve or if you're living, you know, anywhere in the world, I think the word community can be really, um, really inclusive to whoever is in your daily life mm -hmm. and the ones that are around you all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I feel like there's been a lot said about this, um, but I really feel like it bears, it um, is, is something that we need to attend to in this conversation. So I want to ask all three of you um, if you can share with the folks watching, like we've, ta we've talked about this relationship between colonial violence and sexual violence. Um, and I would like to ask um, any of you three, if you could expand on that thought a little bit. Um, I guess for myself, I see them truly as part and parcel of one another, like the genocidal project that is Canada rests on violence against true spirit folks, women, cis and trans, like it is totally baked into the system. It's not, um, uh, and like you see that in like the regulation of gender in the regulation of bodies, um, regulations through like colonial impositions like blood quantum. I mean, I think that Amber is probably better situated to talk about this because of the research that they did, but I want to give Amber a little break. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I mean, it's so baked into what Canada is. Mm -hmm. um, I I just, I noted a question in the comments that I also wanted to. Oh, sure. To, which was around like TJ and sex workers. Um, and I think this fits with another theme that all of us had discussed, which is like, you know, if we were allowed to like really dream, what alternatives would we come up with? And, um, you know, part of that dream is also like the end of the illegal state known as Canada. Um, but also like, you know, allowing ourselves to be unencumbered by like austerity and stigma and institutional power. And so um, transformative justice is partly about like addressing sexualized violence and harm. But to me, it's also about housing mm. and safe working conditions. Um, ability to access the medications that you want to use um, without fear of criminalization. Um, because I think that transformative justice is really about like create like creating and cultivating conditions that minimize harm. And um, sometimes I think abolitionist folks get labeled as pretending like nothing's wrong. Um, I think better than a lot of folks we see what's wrong. Um, but also recognize that like we are in 
a state of relations with each other in the state that makes everything a hundred million times worse, right? Um, especially as we're like in community, um, trying to have right relations, um, but working three jobs or worried about our housing or, um, you know, and I mean, again, amplified by COVID, doing work that feels unsafe, but not being able to access income supports. Um, so I think with TJ, we can look at like, um, defunding and divesting from policing and taking all that fucking money. And it's a lot of money. It's more money than any of us are ever going to see in our lives. Um, and really like investing in communities, um, investing in the things that we know that work. And for all the reasons we've outlined, we know that like the criminal justice system isn't working for survivors. Um, we, we cannot, and I think it's to our detriment to pretend that like, these upstream solutions will prevent harm and violence. Um, just like policing in prison doesn't eradicate a rape culture, neither does access to housing and safe supply, but maybe we can like at least have the fucking conditions to think and to like imagine safety. Um, and I think about like, yeah, with sex workers' rights and sex workers' safety, we've seen how that's totally been derailed by a carceral feminism um, that's dominant in institutions across Canada that get a lot of money. Um, so in spite of everything that sex workers are saying around like what they need in order to have safe, better working conditions, we've seen the advancement of an agenda that like perpetuates the Nordic model anti-trafficking rhetoric, all of these things, which again, just, you know, fail to address like basic safety. Like if we were allowed to like turn down the volume on carceral feminism, what could we turn up the volume on? Mm. Like access to safe working space, independent working space, appropriate housing, like all of these things. Yeah, I think I love that. And actually I love how you framed that. Um, as creating the conditions for safety. That's such a, a poignant way of putting it. That's, um, that it feels refreshing to me to think of transformative justice in that way. Um, so just in our last four minutes, um, and actually you spoke to our kind of our, our last and I think my favorite of our questions, which is um, if we were all allowed to really dream if we could, if we felt like we could achieve whatever we wanted, what alternatives to criminal justice might we come up with? Um, so I think for me, it's not so much a matter of, you know, coming up with a perfect scenario in your minds and then implementing them in real life. But I think actually there are very concrete and tangible goals that could have like massive transformations. And so those are kind of things that I think about. So kind of like what um, has already brought, been brought up, you know, like having a less precarious condition for all. And I think in the case of sexual violence in particular, having the resources to support survivors whose experiences with violence place them currently in precarious positions so I think the ways of addressing that would include, you know, like affordable housing, adequate health care, safe injection sites, like the structures that are in place to support the healing process of people who have experienced abuse so that as a way of, you know, breaking the cycle. And I think, you know, something else um, that is tangible that I think needs to happen is that we need to stop relying on prisons and police as the catch-all solution to all social problems and a step towards that is just to stop constructing new prisons and to close down prisons and di divesting from them and investing money towards social services and um, I think that you know like in when we think about prisons people often think it's like, oh, there's like issues in society, there's like a rise in crime rate, and that's why we build more prisons. But really what happens is like prisons get built for a variety of reasons, and then they're filled. And like people's arrest rates then go high, go get higher. And you know, like, 
like prisons come first and then they're filled. Um, and so I think like for us, once we stop these, this solution as like being what, sorry, I'm like losing my stream. Of <laughs> it's okay. But um, I think like shutting down prisons is not sufficient in creating mm -hmm. a more just system, but I think it's an important step for to force us to address harm in other ways, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you, Kristen. I think that taking small steps towards our larger goal is definitely something that a lot of more, a lot of people can do on their own. And I just wanted to plug one of a book uh, that I just found on TJ. It. It's really good. And it's, there's lots of BIPOC authors and um, you can find it on Amazon. I just think that even as someone who may not know a lot about transformative justice, may not have an idea of what it looks like or how it's done, I think that educating ourselves on other ways of looking at dealing with harm is definitely something that we can start today and even tomorrow so that we have more of us that are thinking about these big dreams. Awesome. Well, that is the perfect note to finish up on right on time. Um, I want to thank everyone one more time. Um, everyone who, oh, Minakshi's got one more. <laughs> I've actually never seen that one. Yeah, me neither. Uh, yeah, this is a book called The Feminist and the Sex Offender, mm -hmm. Confronting Sexual Harm, Ending State Violence. It's um, edited by Judith Levine and Erica Miners. Um, right. Erica Miners grew up in the Fraser Valley and went on to be a big bad prison abolitionist based in Chicago. And they're definitely one of my mentors, so. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Vinakshi. Um, yeah, so I want to offer my gratitude um, again to the folks who are watching and um, hopefully being excited and challenged by these ideas. Um, and I want to thank again all three of our panelists tonight for just your your brilliant insights. Um, I feel like you know, as a feminist organization, we're always being um, pushed by folks just like our panelists and probably by a lot of the folks who are watching right now. Um, to be thinking in new and expansive ways and every time we think we've got it figured out it turns out that we don't and you know that's just that's the excitement and the joy of doing this work so I want to offer thanks for this panel and also for the the continued um, the continued to call to expand our feminism and try new things and to realign with the folks that we really want to be working with. Um, Thank you Felix. Thanks. Thanks. So Thank with the all. <laughs> so everyone in the panel. <laughs> so with that we'll sign off. Um, and it's been it's been such a pleasure to have you guys here tonight. So thanks one more time.